Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, filet of boulet in a ochre jelly reduction, please. Of course. Mm -hmm. ah, garçon, I'll have the uh, crispy rock thighs with um, yeah, the shambling salad. Uh, dressing on the side, please. Oh, absolutely. And we want to do black pudding for dessert. <laughs> Thanks for dining with us as we learn about these fantastic beasts and how to eat them on WebDM. This episode is sponsored by the Epic Legacy Campaign Codex Kickstarter by 2C Gaming. If you've ever wanted to run a 5th edition epic level campaign, this has everything you need. Play any class, including Artificer, up to 30th level, introducing epic races, epic spell creation, brand new classes, and a complete campaign guide with epic adventures in the city of Nexus, the greatest fantasy city in the known realms. We used and love these rules, which is why we are hyped to announce that we are a stretch goal on this Kickstarter. If we hit 34,500, we're going to create the entertainment district of Nexus, the Velvet Alleys. Do you want to see how we create the most epic place to party in all of creation? We'll pledge now. Link here and in the description. Okay, Jim, let's talk about some beasts and all the tasty bits and everything in between. Chew down to the gristles, get to the, to the heat of the meat and down to the bone. First and foremost, what beast in D&D, above all others, do you want to eat? That's kind of tricky, right? Because like you mm -hmm. could you could eat something like say a cockatrice and see if it really does taste like chicken. Yeah. And you could do like you could eat like something that regenerates because its flesh probably isn't that isn't as tough or yeah. gamey, maybe. I really though because like you're thinking about if you think about it like you want to eat something that is eating things that you would otherwise think is yummy, right? So like pigs who've been you know fed acorns. What is the thing you're eating, eating, mm -hmm. and that's probably going to be going to affect how much it, you know, what it tastes like. Yeah, like maybe an abolith, you know, they're like big catfish. That just then raises the point of like, are there any magical benefits for eating certain types of D and D monsters? Because that would certainly change my answer. Considering uh, what it, what what is it a Zorn that eats like precious gems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It yeah. probably tastes a little rich. I imagine that a little brainy. Mm -hmm. I imagine if you can even mm -hmm. get through it, or some one of the oozes, uh, or a cube, or something like a gelatinous cube, like a Jello bowl. Like, yeah. <laughs> Apart from just the silliness of it, I, I I think like eating monsters and using monster parts in your character's cooking is to me like a natural extension of the fantasy world that they're living in, and one of those things that when I was first keyed on to just you know rules for it or a concept of it was just sort of like holy shit why have I not been thinking about this like yeah it's one it was one of those ideas in, in fantasy RPGs where it really was like how in the world am I just now seeing people talk about this and discuss mm -hmm. it uh, and so for me it was like D, D blogs from about a year or so ago would have a lot of thoughts about the matter and some people would post up you know their own homebrew systems or something like that a lot of them were for retro clones or older versions of D&D. It's going to be a home stew system. A home stew system, Sorry. certainly, yeah. But then this year, uh, the joy of monster cooking came out of the DMs Guild, and, and that had some fun uh, stuff in it. And, of course, Xanathar's Guide uh, has, has since come out, uh, since when I was thinking about all this, and it's got, say, cooks utensils there. And what I found was just sort of like, when I went looking for it, there's like rule support for a game in which monsters are harvested for their parts and, and recipes, specific, specifically like magic recipes that impart some sort of benefit on you would become like maybe a normal part of your adventuring mm -hmm. day. As I dug deeper, it was like, wait, there's already kind of rules for all of this already. And this looks suspiciously like alchemy, like just it with, you know, with the serial numbers sort of switched around. And so I was like, this is really kind of a like, Let's talk about this. Let's let's see some mm -hmm. more about you know of how we could explore this idea. Things that you could get from it. How deeply uh, do you think this should be ingrained into uh, DMs games? Whether it's just like one player who wants to do this, uh -huh, or uh -huh. if you make it a part of regular downtime activities, sure. or it's just one a one adventure fling, yeah, or you, yeah. you you do like the whole campaign, like uh, like a friend of the show, uh, Doug Verhovic. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. had a whole campaign when I started Star Wars Bound. It was in a shared universe, but his whole deal was they were on a ship. 
It was basically a magic reality TV show, like yes. like like Chopped or whatever. Uh, uh -huh. And they go to different planets, and they have to go hunt something and make something from it, oh, yeah. and be judged on it. I mean, it was the full like cooking show experience. Nice, you know. And he had rules for it all, and it was great. I think of all of the symbolism and meaning and ritual that surrounds eating and cooking and and food preparation and and, and all the like, where the animals are raised, the sources of the food, like all of that. And like many things that we, we talk about here on WebDM, it, it starts with like, what's going on in the real world with this thing? What are people doing in actual real life that we can draw inspiration from or like extrapolate to an absurd degree or whatever it is to make fantastical? And and it, it seems like such a logical step to go, you know, these ingredients have symbolic meaning. Mm -hmm. The way that you prepare them has uh, a symbolic or, or cultural meaning. And the fact that you're using you know, magical ingredients using magical cooking techniques with magical, you know, utensils even maybe. <laughs> like, it, it creates a world where magical feasts are common, where the king, uh, you know, hosts a banquet and it's like they're serving, you know, roast chimera and manticore. And it's a world where, you know, your, your character gets uh, turned to stone and someone has to harvest the glands from a basilisk that converts the stone chunks back into flesh so that they can eat it, which means that they've got to go in there and, and properly clean and gut the animal and have to prepare these glands a certain way. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, then you, they can be used uh, you know, to restore, restore you to flesh. And that's what I mean when it's sort of like, it, there, what's the difference between that and creating, say, a potion and using those glands to create a stew or something that you feed to the petrified? Uh, po you know, person or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I find that th my mind just like wanders in these crazy directions whenever I think about eating monsters and preparing them. Yeah, and it's uh, it's fun. Like you said, uh, using reality as a touchstone. I mean, yeah. like the 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 most simple thing of a hunter going out and taking down the prey. Yeah, and giving proper respect to it, and then you. Then you eat its heart to gain its power. Like real world hunters did that. So what happens when you do that to a dragon sure, and sure. you go straight Khaleesi on its heart <laughs> and you eat the whole thing in one batch and make your constitution save? Yeah, like yeah. maybe for the rest of the day you get pebbly skin and you get a plus two natural armor bonus Something for like, like a day or for like a week. Yeah, just yeah. like temporary bonuses, almost like ciphers from, from almost, the cipher yeah. system. Yeah. You know, just like a little thing. It lasts about a day, but it would incentivize people to, to really think about the things yeah. that they're going out and it's not just like oh I want some XP right back to what you were saying like what kind what is the structure of this how do you incorporate it into a game like you could you could have that sort of situation where they're going out looking for specific monsters and for specific reasons to get specific bonuses and and maybe you just extrapolate that into a full-fledged monster hunter type game where the point of this mm -hmm. you, you go hunting the monsters not necessarily for XP uh, although you would you know probably advance from that in some measure but you're there because they provide other benefits that you want, not just the experience of it. You, you wanna see what happens when you combine certain organs from these creatures to make a composed dish that is invigorating in a, in a magical sense or protects you against something. You might have a, a situation where the monarch or a king or something is putting on a, a party and you're the ones in charge of having to go and hunt down the beasts and make sure that they're killed the proper way, make yep. sure that they're prepared the proper way, make sure that you know, all that stuff. Yeah, you're on the party planning committee and right. you've got to make sure that Michael's happy <laughs> right. with uh, his the king's anniversary party. Or it could be something different. Maybe you're trapped somewhere subterranean and it's having to, you know, your your surface food is slowly dwindled until it's nothing but crumbs in a burlap sack and and now you're scraping lichens and other forms of uh, subterranean vegetation off the walls. You're eating, you know, disgusting, grotesque things <laughs> that you never would have thought of before, and it's changing you. Bugs right? that you can't even see because it's so dark. You spend too much too much time eating those things, and you find that yeah, your eyes are a bit more attuned to the depths down here. And you know what? I can hear really well, or or you know, my sense of smell is is become so potent that I rely more on it than I do anything else. And, mm -hmm. and it's because you're eating the, you know, you're per you have become a part of the local ecosystem, which is suffused with magic, which influences the creatures that live in it. And like, once I start thinking of my d, d world in a holistic sense like that, once I stopped going like magic is a thing that intelligent peoples engage in through the practice of spell casting. And I went, nope, 
magic is at every level of my campaign. <laughs> and, yeah. and I like a blend of science and magic. I like using scientific concepts and thinking about them in, ter in magical terms and vice versa. So I, you know, maybe magical food pleases the enchanted bacteria that live in your stomach or something, or maybe magic food is a way that you can even get some of these uh, superhuman abilities that some D and D characters have. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's that the fighter is uh, is responsible for finding enemies that have strength and vigor and 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 agility and using their parts, eat, partaking of their hearts, wearing their skins, uh, eating their uh, you know, muscles or drinking mm -hmm. their blood is all part of imparting those qualities to yourself. Oh yeah. A totem barbarian, right? There you go. Oh right? yeah, no, What yeah. if you've got to, yeah, that's sort of, uh, you might twist well, things up for that. Especially if, uh, you know, you gotta drink the blood of a strong whatever, maybe a bull sure, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's how you get that uh, 17th level flight ability because <laughs> Red Bull gives you wings. <laughs> And I do agree with that completely, and even to to the extent of just like that's how you get hit die back on short rest. You got to because oh, sure, yeah. you're eating these these magically uh, in, uh, suffused uh, ingredients. Do you see like where you set a limit on that? Do you see a limit on that? Because like um, like I would say an example I really like uh, recently we played Adventures of Middle Earth and like yeah. the whole honey cake yes. thing. Yeah, right? it was really cool. Like, really but weird. but can you see how somebody might? abuse that yeah just right. so you know just like oh i never have to worry about anything because i've got <laughs> fucking like a duffel bag full of this item that i make right. all the time right. if the resources that are being that you use are kept limited you could do this a lot of different ways maybe the only magic benefit comes from organ meat you know you, you, yeah they just uh, organs you know and animals process all kinds of, uh, of things you know what if it's basically like the equivalent of a magical liver that filters out you know harmful magic in uh, in their environment vestigial organs that interact with magic uh that are inside these creatures and you know you you're not eating the whole body necessarily or maybe you make the rest of it just gets turned into regular jerky or something you know mm -hmm. but the ones that have the benefit are are you know number one I would say, you know, you, you don't just take these things out. Like, you, there is a skill role involved in the extraction and harvesting of these ingredients. And, and that's assuming that there's not also skill roles in the finding of them. And then the actual hunt itself, which may or may not be conducted as combat, it might be conducted as, they say, a skill challenge of some kind. So there's a lot of different ways along the line that, there's, that, that what they want can be placed out of their reach. And if the really good stuff is placed with, like, really rare monsters, and if you combine this with a naturalistic encounter table that says like not every monster can be found in every environment or, or even ones that they're always found in, it's like we need the I don't know, crimson hide basilisk for, for this one particular dish. Well, it's like you can really only find them in this one very limited area of the mm -hmm. world. And they have cycles that they go through. Sometimes they're in hibernation, sometimes they're out. Like it's an opportunity for the players to both learn something about their world that they live in and like care about the monsters that are in it or at least like want to interact with them in ways that are not just like let's kill them and get the xp in well, this yeah. instance it's, it's let's find out where they are <laughs> how we can best take them down and kill them in a certain way or apprehend them in a certain way and, and or trap them or whatever well it sounds to me like you're actually trying to turn your players into conservationists where you understand that sometimes you need to mm. hunt them for their uh, obviously valuable ingredients and yeah. useful ingredients yeah. but if you're not, you want to protect them. You right. want to keep others from poaching them. Yeah, yeah. And that's that can that can actually introduce a I don't know a, a, a more in depth and nuanced uh, look at the monsters other than just a bag of hit points <laughs> that give you a bag of XP, right? So what about the locals that live there? And and if there are monsters there that that consuming them or parts of them give a certain benefit, then would the locals not have that in uh, you know sort of like caught up in their cuisine and as a part of their cuisine mm -hmm. or or um, yeah, God, this didn't even touch on the non-food uses <laughs> for all of these, you oh. know, for, for creatures. Because normally these beasts are normally just like, well, you kill it, skin it, take the teeth. Yeah, usually that's about it. That's about yeah. it. And then you sort of like leave there, you know, you're gonna leave a carcass of a manticore behind for a dragon to feast mm -hmm. on. That's how you get, you know, carry on dragons. It's better than <laughs> checking your dragon. The, the price is to check a dragon. Yeah, at what point does the food become magical? Is this something that anyone can do? Is it the practice of it? Is it inherent in the ingredients? Like all of these things are going to be determined by the background magic in your mm -hmm. world. And and I, I just think it's a good place to have like non-flashy, non-whiz-bang style magic 
It was just like, yeah, you know, we, we, there's a certain dish that we cook at a certain time of year that confers benefits. Or, you know, we, we brew this certain drink, you know, or ferment this certain drink, distill this certain spirit in order to induce a certain state of mind. Or it's a part of a spell component uh, or something like that. There's a lot of ways in which you don't necessarily have to, like, create new systems for magic food, although... Like I said, the the framework is already there in, in fifth mm -hmm. edition. It could just be that like you substitute certain types of monster parts and what you know uh, for spell components. You know, do you want to cast fireball? Then you need to get like a you know I don't know a fire lizard gizzard <laughs> you know, for your wizard. <laughs> a fire lizard gizzard for your wizard. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I would name him Rizza. Uh, right. It used uh, to have to be that you'd eat an adder stomach to cast acid arrow. Right. Right. You know, you had to like actually take that snake stomach and eat it before you could project a, a, an acidic arrow. That's sort of an intermediary step where you're not going the, the whole hog. I'm made up a subsystem and people are like collecting parts and they've got their monster inventory sheet. I have a refrigerated <laughs> bag of holding yeah. that keeps all my parts fresh. That's another one. Another sort of limitation of it is, is how long does this stuff keep? Mm -hmm. Does it, you know, how long is it potent? How, yeah. you know, when does it go bad? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love thinking about that being a pharmacy tech, like when do things expire, but also in the crafting of them, like if you don't, if you screw it up while you're harvesting it or, yeah. or creating it, yeah. that affects how long it's good for and the potency of the effect. With trying to harvest these things, I think it can also, it can be one of those things that, well, when you kill something, that's going to breed like mm -hmm. scavengers, carry yeah, on, exactly. everything yeah. around, and you have to harvest this stuff immediately. And so now you just got done with an encounter, you're trying to pull all this stuff out, now the bushes start mm -hmm. shuffling, yep. and you hear the cries of the vulture, you know, lizards overhead. Yep. And how long are you going to stick around? How long are you going to really stick around? Like yeah. now it can get overwhelming <laughs> right. to a party. There's a lot of considerations there. And, and you know, if you're not hunting monsters for a specific, specific reason, uh, mm -hmm especially like an in-setting reason, then most of this just gets glossed over. You never really think about it. But, you know, considering those things, how long does it take? Uh, should you use the monster's hit die as a gauge for those kinds of things? Uh, or should you not and use their size category or something? I think a lot of this can be abstracted into sort of a generic skill challenge type situation where you're looking to get X number of successes before three failures and the players oh, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, have a hand in dictating which skills they're using as long as they're not using the same ones uh, twice in the same encounter. And like, that's a good way to abstract it. I'm, I sit on the fence with skill challenges. Sometimes I like them, sometimes I don't. Yeah, I think this is a good use to, especially the, that Xanathar's uh, section on combining skill and tool proficiency. Oh yes, yeah. So now you're combining your arcana, if it's a magic beast, you're uh -huh. combining your arcana with your either you know, your tanner's tools to skin it skin or it your, like your cooking tools mm -hmm. to extract the proper organs. Certainly, certainly. And, and you know, like you said, you know, you get three successes or three failures and you, you ruined that dragon's, you know, fire gland yeah. that yeah. you needed to, you know, drink and spit fire. Well, you could. It works just like a potion of fire breath, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that is what a potion of fire breath is, is those glands or organ meat or something. But I like what you're saying, where it's like you're combining tool and skill proficiencies. You might It might be like, are you skilled in survival and cooks utensils? Then maybe this isn't a role for you. Maybe uh, the only reason you might roll is, you know, is for something else, or, or it takes it from a skill challenge to a simple just roll once kind of mm -hmm. situation yeah. where it's easier for you. You can combine those. You can say like, well, there's just no role needed for this period because of, of how skilled you are. But I think like if something comes with a benefit, then there needs to be some sort of risk or cost because otherwise you might get a situation where they're everybody's like stuffing their faces full of magic food and <laughs> walking around with all kinds of buffs but that'd be another one where i might be like yeah eating that much eating that many magical calories is going to have an impact on you i think we were talking about this the other day but just like the, the takeoff of like eating fey food sure yeah or magic food like this i mean if you're not an inherently magic creature maybe it starts changing you yeah and not for the better it could be a thing where it's almost it could be an addiction yeah it could be an addiction, um yeah. or it just starts changing you what if what if you eat too many magic fish and then all of a sudden you start growing gills yes and you find it kind of hard to just walk around all day and i need to go swim now because yeah. i'm getting a little lightheaded because you're not getting enough oxygen from your lungs which are slowly dissolving as the magic calories build up in your body they they sort of like form a concentrated mutagen it either changes you or it becomes like a dependency thing mm -hmm. like you can't survive without magic mm -hmm. food maybe magic food is so nourishing 
and so oh. sustaining yeah. that to try to go back to regular food is like trying to eat paper mache or yeah. sawdust. Yeah, there's a couple of calories in there, <laughs> but you got to eat a lot to find it. And maybe you find that your magic users and spellcasters have to engage in this sort of like hyper nutrient uh, magic food because it's the only way they can get the energy to survive spell casting. Like otherwise, normal food does not give you the caloric intake that you need. You will mm -hmm. burn, you will literally burn yourself up. Now you dipped into uh, I forgot the character's name in Scott Pilgrim, but it was like the second Evil X, the vegan. Yeah. You had all of his like special powers <laughs> from being <laughs> vegan, <laughs> uh, but if you eat normal food, you lose all you your powers. There could be an entire subclass. I can, I can imagine a monk subclass based on that. I can imagine a sorcerer class based on that. Oh, de definitely just, a sorcerer class. Yeah, where you're just like, you know, you're balancing the internal magical humors of yourself in order mm -hmm. to produce certain things um God, that didn't even we haven't even touched on magic plants like when you were talking about like uh in a certain like monsters of a certain area well there's going to be certain flora that uh -huh. that that uh -huh. come up in that area so it's all going to be part of the cuisine of the sure. people of that area sure. so you're gonna have to go in and, and grab multiple things or in order to eat this beast you have to prepare it with this spice or flour yeah. otherwise it's deadly cooking techniques which turn deadly monster parts into edible food mm -hmm. uh, is a big one. And, and you know, like this is another one of those where in our own world, there's like how many foods out there, fish are like, or... especially fish, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it, I mean, cause fish are, I don't know, it's a whole other world down there. And, and many of them are it's toxic. A whole new world. A bit of a, yeah, it is Sorry. <laughs> oh wait, that was Aladdin. Damn it. Ah! Part of your world. Part of your world. Yeah, <laughs> like mm -hmm. our own history has been like, well, you know, if you cut out this part of the fish and very tenderly, then you can eat the rest of it. It'd be fine. Mm -hmm. How many people did it take to learn that? How long did it take for, for someone to realize that, that you could eat, say, this variety of puffer fish and not die? Or yeah, you well, could that's... take this fish and mix it up with salt and bury it in the ground for a while and then that's, eat it. Uh, that's the beauty of adaptation <laughs> and uh, survival of the fittest, Jim. Right. Because eventually you figure it out. They're like, well, you got to do it this one yeah, way. You got to do it this way. So in, in a D and D world, maybe it's the maybe it's essential salts. You know, maybe it's mummy dust or mm -hmm. uh, or something else, which incidentally was also a big culinary item uh, in our world, uh, which is why there's not a lot of mummy dust left. We snorted it all. <laughs> it could be that, you know, you bury them in that or, or yeah. salt from the elemental planes or, or, or anything that, uh, I mean, you know, so, salt infernal from, sulfur. Yeah, salt you know? from the quasi-elemental plane of, 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 of air and water. Yeah. Which, or uh, no, it'd be earth and water. Um, be like, yeah, a briny, uh, like a briny, whatever. whatever but yeah. man, let me tell you, you'd think sea salt's good. Oh yeah. <laughs> they would really have a lot of fun with Thinking up magical ingredients, thinking up ways to like incorporate them into your game and centerpiece of say social encounters. You know, are you trying to like entertain someone at, at your, you know, mm -hmm. your special abode and, and cook them a magical feast that will impress them? You know, maybe yeah, yeah. the magical feast has enchantments laden into it that will charm and and delight the senses. Maybe it's worked against you, right? Like uh, I'm thinking of the Turkish delight from Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe where mm -hmm. it's like, eat this confection that you've never had before that I've got an infinite amount of entice the uh, you know the, mm -hmm. the the player with the some sweet meats that extension of like the the, the fey always offering you food because they, they give some kind of power over you because you feed them something right right well, or, do or that. The eating consists of like a, an agreement to a contract yeah right so that's sort of like like in say ice and fire song of ice and fire or a lot of those like fairy tales like mm -hmm. breaking bread eating you know yep. taking a, a bread and salt bread and salt is is a custom is has a uh, a, a a meaning and a, a thing we, are, we we talked a bit about it in our our curses episode of, of like everyday curses and and this maybe is one of those that i could see the magic of this being that if you abide by the the, the custom, then you gain this benefit. But if you break it, you are cursed. And then maybe food doesn't give you nourish, proper nourishment, so you start gaining levels of exhaustion, even though exhaustion. you got plenty of sleep. Oh, sure, I mean, sure, that yeah. might take you a day or two to realize like everything you eat just kind of goes through you. <laughs> just goes right there, and yeah. it doesn't give you anything. Because you've offended the spirits of the household. You know, mm -hmm. that's that they are there to ensure that custom and tradition, which includes the ways that food is cooked and eaten, yeah. uh, are respected and not, uh, you know, not flaunt, you know. Those are sort of like, 
I don't know, just some wild <laughs> sort of like considerations that oh, yeah. run through my mind. And the thing is, is there's a lot of a lot of inspiration to draw from. Yes. out there. I mean, like you can pick any personality on the fucking on the Food Network. Yeah, and that can be a version of a D and D character. I mean, oh, you so. have some personal experience with right. uh, with Emma. <laughs> yeah, our, yeah. Our, our our lovely uh, our lovely communications director. Uh, came up with uh, Escape from Flavor Town. Uh-huh. Last year, she uh, she escaped from Flavor Town, and we were we were sort of like sat down, like what would be in a kind of like magical industrial kitchen, you mm-hmm. know, and not just like a a cozy you know cottage uh, you know stew pot, but like these are sentient meats, <laughs> different sauces that provide certain bonuses, and like uh, you know the idea of food transforming you into a monster, like you mm-hmm. eat something and and become that. Uh, kind of creature or take on their aspects. We covered a lot of it uh, for that one shot, and then really only since then, if I that was sort of when I realized that, like, gosh, there are a lot of people out there who've been thinking about this mm-hmm. and writing up systems for it. I hate myself that I can't remember the anime, the manga of Delicious and Dungeon. Is, well, there's uh, that one, but there's also it starts with a T. Or, uh, oh, uh, Toriko. Toriko. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen more than a few episodes of that, but that's just, it's so amazing. Like how each monster has like a level and a, uh, and a whatever that it gets you. And yep. I don't know. It's like, I mean, that kind of stuff. It's just, it's, it's, to me, it's beautiful uh, because it's a whole different, like uh, and the idea of fighting a monster and the way you fight them is also how you pre- prepare oh, yeah. them mm-hmm. for dinner. Yeah. And that the techniques that you're using are you preparing them to be skinned? It'd be like a culinary fighter mm-hmm. subclass, like a blade, like a blade master type. Yeah. That, uh, you know, as their their slice, master, their slices cut off fillets. And you get done, and there's just everything's piled up, and you got your sauces here, and you just start the campfire, and you start cooking right there. Yeah, just imagine little. like a Benihana chef, right? Where they do the whole <laughs> thing in the middle of combat. Including the little steam volcano. Like if they have a searing sword, then then they could mm-hmm. cook as they cut. Yeah, as they cut a like slice off, cutting and then it flings it back to mm-hmm. their friends, as, to the henchmen that yeah, are back there, back preparing yeah. preparing the feast. Yeah. So yeah. the second combat is over, everybody turns around, and there's a full prepared feast right there, man. That's just. You. I mean, I feel like that's that that's just showing off. Like they're just. Yeah. That's, that's trying too hard. I don't know. Man. <laughs> if that's your whole deal, you know, some people want to rule the world. Some people want to overthrow governments. I just want to prepare a good, a, a damn good dinner. There's a lot of like just concepts and ideas, and and there is a lot more we could talk about. But I'm I am interested in like the mechanics of it, like, yeah. uh, and I I think number one, if, if you go and look in the I believe it's the player's handbook, you'll find that food like needing to eat and drink has two separate rules associated with it. If you don't eat, you automatically gain a level of exhaustion. But it's possible to stave off exhaustion from dehydration by being really good at constitution saves. It seems to me that should be reversed. One, since you can only last about three days without water and like yeah. a couple of weeks without food. And with the dehydration, there's a, you know, you're saving to avoid taking on two levels of exhaustion instead of one. Like you're oh. automatically get one, but then the save, if you fail, you get two, whereas it's just automatic one with food. So I would probably like merge them together and just you know use dehydration, but with a different uh, time onset for food, uh, because I do like the idea that you have to save uh, to do this. So that's sort of like the base rule. There's already rules in here for eating, for uh, for whatever. There's already a variant rule that says you don't get your hit die back until you've been able to eat and drink and rest. Uh, and, and so in that sense, the part this is part of the foundation that I was uh, talking about. The other ones that I would, the other rules that I would look at are the foraging rules uh, from travel, which are in the DMG, which just kind of tell you how much food you would get, the forage action while traveling. And that can represent collecting of spices, herbs, uh, smaller things that you might eat. You know, this is, a lot of this has been around uh, magical food and the like, but you know, there's nothing stopping you from eating the dire rats in a dungeon because you're rations got spoiled you know uh which is which is really sort of the whole basis that i had for this video is like doing something more with those two weeks worth of rations <laughs> you know most of the time you write it down at character creation and you never think about it after that but you know if you're trapped somewhere and you got to eat what you got to eat then you might be glad that you gave it some thought mm-hmm. um, well but what if there's only like <laughs> sentient creatures around cannibalism and and sort of like the eating of sentient creatures is a you know it's something that you'll want to discuss with your group certainly Mm -hmm. um now i have i know what happens 
in, in my world, it's that if you eat a dead sentient creature, you become a ghoul eventually. And if you eat a live one, you become possessed by the spirit of you know who, which is basically Wendigo. That's how I've handled it. They're, you know, demons will, will, uh, are attracted to that kind of taboo behavior, but maybe they're not in yours. And maybe the eating of sentient creatures is no big deal because mm -hmm. maybe there's like 64 different kinds of them and there's yeah. so many of them and there's an infinite variety out in the multiverse so what does it matter how many there are you would want to think about that though because there are some situations that you're you'll find yourself as a player in that say eating a party member might be the only way your character survives you know you might be trapped somewhere where uh, cannibalism is just sort of what's going to happen maybe mm -hmm. a henchman first for a fellow party member but those are obviously things that you want to like talk about with the group uh beforehand and if you're curious as to why this would come up at all and what the hell we're talking about then i have a crazy number of rpgs in which cannibalism is directly addressed yeah. with a variety of <laughs> consequences and benefits for it so mm -hmm. it is a thing that comes up in some games and just watch the movie alive you know, certainly you know, right uh, yeah <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Actually, don't do that if you don't really have to. Um, <laughs> but you might get some you might get some penalties from that. The you know magical prions or something like that. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. a, you got to be careful uh, with what you eat. So, yeah, yeah. Especially, it, especially like a mind flayer brain. Oh, certainly, to me right, is, yeah. would be the greatest delicacy of all. But that you gotta be which really eats careful. Other brains. That which eats other brains. Um, Maybe it's like a moray eel, and that like you're not supposed to eat like eels and other big fish like that because like all of the toxins in the water build up in these apex predators like. What if all the magic brain toxins that are from all these fantasy rays from drinking potions and having magical spells live in their brains, you know, and, and all these kinds of things get built up in the mind flare. And if you eat a mind flare brain, then I mean, you might achieve psychic apotheosis or you might get turned inside out. Like, who mm -hmm. knows, right? Yeah, you might, yeah, you might go straight Cronenberg. Right. Just... <laughs> to kind of return a bit to the mechanic stuff, this is why I would include mechanical benefits to these, because you can avoid those things by, say, a series of good spell ch or skill checks, uh, the use of spells and ingredients to counteract certain things. It, it, you know, in a really detailed system like this, you could keep track of which foods cancel out which other ones. Gosh, now I just thought of the fact that there are certain ways of even eating and, you know, constructing a diet, which would be... Are we, are we talking well, paleo, Atkins diet? I mean, we're talking all kinds of different... I mean, <laughs> we, we move well beyond those. Well, you could do a paleo because you'd probably just, like, travel back there and, you know, get the kind of food that you need. But you've harvested. You've identified where the monster is. You've harvested. You've got your magical plants. You've made your survival rolls, your nature rolls, your cooks tools and all that stuff and it comes down to like actually preparing them you know is this a downtime activity that's done at camp that you you know sort of engage in um is it tied is the act of eating these things beyond like getting uh, a, a little magical benefit uh, is there anything like that do you get back hit die for them do you get back some sort of resource maybe there's magic food that restores spell slots or maybe there's uh, food mm. like uh, honey cakes in, in Adventures of Middle Earth that takes away exhaustion. Yeah. You know, and you, uh, you know, maybe you gain more benefit the more complex the meal is, you know, so that the more things you've gathered and the more items that you have you're eating, that maybe it restores more of whatever it is that you'd like to. But I do think this is where you have that final constitution saving throw because magical food poisoning should be a thing. Like, it could be a risk, you know, you're eating dangerous food strange dangerous food you know you would want to uh have some sort of uh guidelines in place for what happens when it goes wrong and it, it comes back up mm -hmm. or it wasn't prepared right uh, yeah, or, or, or it goes completely right and you have some magical tea and biscuits and then you're a god yeah yeah because you, you have just the get best like a, tea time uh, best ever. yeah the, the very very absolute best it, it gives you a, a you know a benefit and a drawback or you find that at first it gives you a really great benefit and then the more and more you eat of it the less unless you get of that benefit until mm -hmm. now you're like dependent and if you don't have it you suffer drawbacks oh yeah you, you know that's that sort of addictive quality that you were talking about yeah oh yeah you're addicted to tea you become a tea expert but you constantly refer you know, you constantly say i i really like chai tea all the time <laughs> and everybody's like but you're like no trust me i'm the expert when i think of like other mechanical considerations for this I'm struck by the fact that the alchemist as written, and as the time of this filming, the alchemist is not, or not alchemist, ar, uh, artificer, as written, uh, which is still in playtest, has a really, like, just 
a perfect correlation between the kind of character I envision and the way that the artificer practices their magic through the use of tools. And you really could probably, I might, probably would use the alchemist and just have like a vegetable person that is their homunculus, you know, like one of those early modern uh, portraits of a Habsburg. But that's just kind of it. Like they're always at their stew pot cooking. They're always gathering ingredients uh, to cook. They're always drying something, preparing something, doing this, that, the other. They've got a little vegetable person thing that helps them out. Oh, to me, it looks like a rat. It's like ratatouille. They help you cook. You wouldn't have to do much with an artificer to make them a cuisine mage. Yeah, a gourmand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you could use that gourmand feat from that one un un unearthed arcana, um, which I've, off the top of my head, it's like extra hit die whenever you take a short rest, uh, bonus to saves versus disease, and like maybe one other benefit. I forget. But it's a nice feat. Uh, probably one of my... More, the more interesting ones from that one. But if you're looking for stuff that's not in, uh, you know, published materials, then I would recommend two outside sources. The one, the first one would be the Joy of Monster Cooking from the DMs Guild. And it's got a select number of monsters that have like full recipes of how you would cook them, as well as a suggestion of what the benefits are. Uh, I like that, plus the fact that they've got a, a, a more expanded uh, skill system than what Xanathar's has for cooking utensils. And then the other one is the Monster Manual, which is on the... Uh, <laughs> this is a tasty pun. Uh, which is available on the Coins and Scrolls blog, and it's uh, primarily focused on first edition D&D, but it's a rather um, system agnostic document. And so it has in there like, all right, what do all the like, say, regular animals taste like? It's got a column for the intelligent humanoid species there. Like, what does a goblin taste like or a sahagwin or something? But then for the really fantastic beasts, each one of them gets a description of how you would prepare that dish, a description of what it tastes like, and then a chart that you roll on after, say, making a save versus poison or a constitution saving throw depending on your system. And it's got everything on those charts and like there's one for each monster <laughs> from catastrophic disaster to the best you could, you know, hope for. Mm -hmm. And so like those two um, uh, combined would give you an idea of like what you could do with magical monster food, how you would cook it and, and kind of like completes the mechanical support that um, Fifth edition provides the baseline. So for dessert, Jim, <laughs> ah. let's uh, let's have let's have some quick uh, considerations for trolls and other regenerative monsters. Ooh. Because you don't want your troll to keep growing after you eat it. You don't. You really don't. And but we did have a discussion about this, and we do have acid <laughs> in acid our in stomach. Our stomach for a reason, people. So <laughs> maybe you could just it, just eat small bites. Eat small bites. Yeah, uh, never, never, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get a big chunk of troll flesh in there because then there's going to be too much surface area of that troll flesh that's not being dissolved by acid. Yeah. So you either eat troll meat noodles or uh, <laughs> a crumb crumble. <laughs> like ba like troll bits, like bacon bits, but troll. <laughs> just kind of sprinkle on your salad. Yeah. Uh, Grom the Paunch is a Warhammer goblin that ate a bunch. It was like when, uh, one of the first Warhammer iconic characters I came across. And I was just fascinated by this goblin who gorged himself on troll flesh, got enormous, mm -hmm. gained the regenerative properties of the troll flesh, and then, uh, you know, led a big goblin raid on the high elves, which was unsuccessful. But like, there's just something about it where it, it's, it has stuck with me. And so I've, there's usually either someone in a campaign uh, that I'll have or, or reference of eating troll flesh to gain some kind of uh, you know regenerative ability um, mm -hmm. it, or something. And, and my latest iteration of this is that uh, the vivamancers and the bio mages of the, uh, of the shimmering coast used trolls in a lot of their experiments, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you figure a troll's pretty adept at, uh, at surviving, you know, magical experimentation. They probably have accelerated evolutionary cycle as well, you know, given how, uh, how quickly they regenerate. And it just led me to these bizarre thoughts about trolls. <laughs> and a lot of them were revolved around food of like, would you have to give it an acid bath before so it doesn't grow any bigger, mm -hmm. you know? Or why wouldn't you just like keep a bunch of trolls around and cut off flank steaks from them and eat them, you know? Other than it being cruel and, and, uh, and probably wicked. If you're a troll, can you eat pieces of yourself to stay alive? Do you even die of starvation if you're a troll? 
Um, and then it just got into a, a very bizarre situation where it's like troll surgeons who are taking their own limbs and organs and grafting them into other people as a way to like provide medical services for them or like a troll chef that like shaves off bits of their body and cooks them up as a way of like, you know, I don't know, being a troll chef or something. I mean, uh, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> you're saving money on expenses. You're not having to buy meat. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big cost uh, to run a business. It blew up from there. I just started thinking about like, okay, what are all the, you know, the kinds of monsters that you might uh, have in the world and, and how would you eat them? For some reason, trolls, just <laughs> one of those that I didn't get off of. I'm just like, I'm, all right, that's all I needed. They kind of grow on you or in you. <laughs> There's a lot of fun things you can do with trolls. Graft one of their arms onto yours and see what happens. Um, yeah. Or uh... two of them here, so you can be like a little Goro. <laughs> yes. Graft a, or you eat too much of a troll and then it grows out of your stomach and you got right. a little like quato. A little quato. There's a lot of settings that I've seen, a lot of homebrew settings I've seen uh, with like the, where the Tarrasque fills that function. Oh, and, yeah. and you know, sort of a city that's built around a Tarrasque or a civilization that's built around a Tarrasque that, that just like munches on this creature all day long and, or for centuries in, uh, in the Tarrasque's case. And of course produces all wild you know, mutations and problems for the people that eat it. The Beast of Plenty uh, is what they're called uh, in, uh, in Land Between Two Rivers, a cornucopia beast. And they are not as big as a Tarrasque, but pretty big. And it's just every part of them is useful. Every inner organ can be used to make some kind of potion. Their meat is good and lasts for a long time, tastes mm -hmm. delicious. And it's just like a, a thing where you're, I, I can't remember if I was like inspired by something or if it seems like this would happen. Just like, why wouldn't the mages and druids of the world create a creature that's like all your one-stop shop for all of your nutritional and material needs? That's what the benevolent biomages of Land Between Two Rivers have given that dying hellscape of a world to help the people there survive. We're about combining alchemy with magical cooking, because I think that's the sort of the natural connection there, yeah? When you start mixing in like magical sauces and spices yes. to the cooking, uh -huh. and it, and now you've you've blended spell casting and alchemy and yeah. cooking, and it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, that's that would be like if Heroes Feast was something you didn't just cast, yeah. But the act of eating it was also the act of casting, and Easy. you have to go through the whole thing to yeah. get to the end and, and to get all of those benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I love that kind of stuff. It's already in our stories and our fantasy, um, you know, mm -hmm. like from Alice in Wonderland with yep. with eating different things to grow small and short and, yeah. and, and just substances that change your perception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether that's just your perception of reality or you actually like you eat substances that change your reality. That change is reality, the yeah. next Is the next step of that. I mean, that's all it is, is a natural extension of what we already do. That's why I love it so much. And because it's like, it com it knits together the, the all of the background magic of the world. You, this touches on say, harvesting monsters for making magic items, for mm -hmm. making potions, for making other kinds of things. Harvesting monsters for spell components and, and the things you might need for that. It's like, if you're playing with these rules, you're not hand waving them. You're not saying like, okay, two weeks of rations, you're never gonna worry about food again. All right, you wrote down a component pouch or you have an arcane focus. You're never gonna have to worry about that stuff about spell casting again. Like not every group wants to have to deal with this kind of hassle, which some of them will see it that way. But it's also an opportunity to have like this richer, more complex world that has all these intermoving, interlocking parts. And the more of that there is, the more opportunities the players can go, this part of the world really interests me. Mm -hmm. And I want to explore more of that. And that's when you make the switch from, I'm gonna run the game that I wanna run and they're just gonna have to deal with it, to I wanna run the game that the players wanna run because they are interested in something in my world. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like that's how you get to that place by investing a lot of time and effort into your worlds. Because then you can finally have like the master chef assassin that creates an entire meal oh, man. that once you eat it all, Gosh. it will enact a poison. And of course he's there eating it too, except mm -hmm. he has the one extra ingredient that he put that is in his wine cup. Oh, my God. And Dastardly. as you're having a great time and he's just enjoying watching and then he's uh, from the very end of the tables, they just start dropping like it's, like it's Aria and the, <laughs> <laughs> the house fray. And then he just finishes his meal and has dessert. Has dessert. Oh. Walks out. Peace and quiet at mm -hmm. last. There's limbus bread, right? There's the fact that, that you know, there's, you know, you eat just a nibble of this thing. It will sustain you. And, and, and not just that, but it's like, it suggests a spiritual sustainment as well. But yeah. it's not just going to give you what your body needs, but like 
eating this will be comforting. Eating mm -hmm. this will get you through the dark places. The promise of, of, of exploring this in RPGs is that's mm -hmm. what sort of like holds for me. What do spicy angel wings taste like? Oh, like boneless angel wings? I mean, it, probably, I mean, they're <laughs> boneless angel wings. I bet you that they're really good. Mm -hmm. and you either gain like some healing or some other kind of celestial benefit of them or they're like so pure and and uh, wholesome that you really shouldn't eat more than one or yeah, two. I would think you would literally die of happiness. You might. Yeah, like, you might be so, like, so euphoric. And yeah. so euphoric, like you literally transcend to whatever plane sure. that they so were you have an out-of-body experience and you're like, why would I go back there? Uh -huh. Like I've already, I, I did it all. Yeah. Yeah. Screw it. It's time to go. If you're a fan of the movie oh, yeah. Hook, Robin, Robin Williams movie Hook uh, with uh, Rufio has a great scene of just what I consider magic food. And like when I think of conjure food and water, I think of that scene. It's just like a bunch of colored foam. You know, it's just like whipped, blue whipped cream and pink icing. In many ways, I sort of think of that like spells like say create water or create food or, or hero's feast or something as as creating something that's so flavorful it could never match you know real food can never match it so nutritious real food can never match it you better not eat too much of it because you will really your stomach will change to be like incapable of processing real food mm -hmm. if you continue feeding it this magical substance and so that might be how i'd change like those sorts of uh those sorts of spells like press digitation will make that taste better but it'll make it taste way too good it'll mm -hmm. be like that time where you're just eating chips and you get like the double flavored one uh -huh. you're like oh this could be so good this thing's practically red with cheese and then you eat it and it's just like oh, oh! you know it's never as good as you think it's going to be but that might be my last rambling incoherent thought about magical food but mm -hmm. if you eat the right amount of steak it should give you a flanking bonus oh god if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. WebDM exists thanks to our patrons on Patreon, the WebDM Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes now, including our interview with Wolfgang Bauer, the creator of Cobalt Press. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice, for your games, watch us play. We've got games every week on Twitch and our archive channel on YouTube, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Oh, God. Yeah. Oof. It's very... It tastes like medicine uh, uh, after you quit for a while. Oh, no, I've quit for a long time. The only thing, only soda I've had in the last, I don't know how many months, is main root soda. Rolling? Oh god, that Here wasn't even go. faking it. I seriously almost threw up. Hang on, give me a second. <clears throat> Alright, I'm good.